أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وله الحمد في الآخرة وهو الحكيم الخبير والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث إلى كافة الورى بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته أئمة الهدى ومصابيح الدجا الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وعلم آدم الأسماء كلها صلى الله عليه محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد My respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته as you heard a few moments ago, today's lecture will be on Nabi Adam ala nabiyyina wa alihi wa alayhi salam and the whole topic of teaching in Islam. And inshallah tomorrow I will be discussing learning in Islam and also the role of parents in the learning of our children. And in fact, these two topics, today's and tomorrow's, are quite appropriate to be discussed at these times because apparently exams are going on, as is the case in the UK as well. And so houses, usually at this time of the year, there's a little bit more tension in them and it's a little bit more quiet than usual. And so hopefully these discussions will help in that aspect as well. And in fact, Quite recently, I heard something that drew my attention. It was on the radio. It was about some of the superstitions that students get up to at the time of exams. You know, students will try and do whatever it takes to just help them that bit more in their exams. And so they were going through some of the superstitions that students have. And there was one quite humorous story about, and it's a real story as well, about a student who would buy a lottery ticket wow. before, each, before every exam. And what he would do was, he would scratch off the scratchable area of this lottery ticket, and because the chances of winning the lottery are so low, he thought that by doing this, he's not gonna win the lottery, but he will use up his share of bad luck, okay? And so he would do this before every exam. But then one day, he's doing this before his exam, he scratches off that scratchable area of the ticket, and he sees that he's actually won the lottery. So now, instead of being over the moon about this, he's actually saddened and he's frustrated and he gets into a stressful situation. Because now he thinks that oh, he's used up his allocation of good luck. And so now when he goes to the exam, he'll have nothing but bad luck. So, wow. of course, these are superstitions that people and this particular students get up to if only they would look at the teachings of the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt, like some of the things that we will look at today and tomorrow, they would see that actually there are much greater uh, ways of achieving success in exams and in learning and in teaching from the Islamic perspective. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. So our analysis starts with verse number 30 of Surah Baqarah. And this is where actually the whole story of Nabi Adam starts as well. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this verse, وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَ إِنِّي جَائِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفًا And when your Lord said to the angels that I am appointing on the earth a Khalifa, a representative, a vicegerent. 
Now, how does this relate to the whole concept of teaching? What can we gain from this verse? And how can it inspire us? And in particular, the teachers of the community, whether they are teachers of the madrasa or teachers outside the madrasa, how can it inspire all of us and move us and ourselves closer, us and the community closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Well, first of all, let's start off with the translation of this verse. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the angels that I am appointing on the earth a representative, now, when we look at this, we see that Allah is engaging in what is known as the divine representation. Wow. Engaging in appointing for himself this vicegerent, and he's talking later on in these verses about the creation of Nabi Adam. Now, the first question we need to ask is, well, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala possesses all the perfect attributes, and he is the perfect being is the absolute majestic being and there's no one or nothing better than him, then how is it possible that he appoints for himself a representative? Who can possibly represent something which is perfect in all aspects of his existence? Because the apparent meaning of this verse is that I am appointing for myself a representative on the earth, isn't it? When we read this verse, this is the apparent meaning. So now, how do we answer this question? Well, we need to examine what this whole area of representation refers to. In terms of this verse and its meaning, representation here has a different meaning to what representation normally means in the sort of like non-religious aspect. So, for example, a manager will want to appoint a representative when he's going away. Mm. And that person will take care of affairs in his absence. This is a regular, normal meaning of representation. But when it comes to Allah's divine representation, mm. representation in the field of Islamic spirituality and akhlaq and irfan, it does not mean that type of representation. It means manifestation. This is the key word when it comes to this discussion. Manifesting certain things. We'll come to what those things are in a moment. Other words that we can use to help us understand this whole concept are words such as embodiment. Words such as reflecting. Words such as emulating. Now, what are we talking about? What things? It's all referring to the Asma of Allah. So, this is talking about manifestation of Allah's attributes in that person. So, let's look at this in a bit more detail. Allah says He is appointing this person, Nabi Adam, to be His representative on the earth. We have just said that He's talking about manifesting His attributes. How does this work? Well, when we look at the verse that I recited a few moments ago at the beginning of this lecture, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the same passage, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا When Allah taught Adam the names, all of them, what are these names? These names refer to those attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I was referring to a few moments ago. So, when we put all this together, it means Allah is appointing for Himself a representative on the earth that will manifest His beautiful names. That's what it means. How does this work? Well, look at all the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's just take a few of these. So Allah is Al-Adil, the All-Just. He is Al-Alim, the All-Knowing. He is Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, He is Al-Alim, the Compassionate, the Merciful, the All-Knowing. What this means is that Nabi Adam, and in this story of course, Nabi Adam is being an exemplar for all human beings, us included. It means that human beings must also be Adil, 
not al adil because that's just exclusive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he must be just up to the capacity of his own existence. So all of us must manifest the attributes of Allah up to our own particular level. So Allah is al adil, we must be adil just according to our limitations and our abilities. Allah is al alim the all knowledgeable, we must also be knowledgeable up in our own limited ways. Allah is, for example, merciful. We must also be merciful. He is Al-Hakim, the All-Wise. We must also be wise. This is what is meant by manifesting Allah's attributes in ourselves. Like I mentioned yesterday, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He talks about this, and He's also referring to how we are able to do this in these verses. In the tradition we read, تَخَلَّقُوا بِأَخْلَاقِ اللَّهِ Embody those attributes of Allah. Those akhlaq are referring to His wonderful and His beautiful names. تَخَلَّقُوا بِأَخْلَاقِ اللَّهِ is referring to the same concept. Manifest, embody the names and the beautiful attributes of Allah in yourselves. So now, when we look at this, we see that, in fact, a human being can get to a station whereby he's not just manifesting those names at a very low level, but he's able to manifest those names at the highest possible level for a human being. Those people are known as complete human beings. Al-Insanul Kamil, the perfect human being. Now, who are these perfect human beings. We are told in the traditions, in particular this one from Imam Ali ibn, uh, from Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Muhammad When he refers to the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, what does he say? Nahnul asma'ul husna. We are the beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does that mean? That means exactly what we've been discussing up to now. That they are in that position of being able to manifest Allah's attributes in their character up to the highest level possible for human beings. And therefore, they are the Asma al Husna in, in reality, in the human capacity, the walking, talking manifestations and embodiment of Allah's divine attributes. So now let me illustrate it in another way. Sometimes when we use stories and examples, we are able to understand some of these theoretical concepts even better. The great Persian poet Jalaluddin Rumi, he puts it in a very beautiful way. He describes this painting competition that is taking place between two groups of people. These two groups are the Chinese and the Byzantines. Now, in Persian literature, the, the Chinese are always depicted as being the master painters. So, now there's this competition taking place and it's taking place in this sort of like palace. The idea is that each side would, would create their painting on the walls of this palace. The walls are made of this very beautiful and high quality marble. So the Chinese are on one side and the Byzantines are instructed to do their painting on the other side. So now there's a curtain is drawn, they have some time to do their painting and everything. And the Chinese are busy behind their curtain, the Byzantines, the Romans are busy behind their curtain. So now, after the time limit is over, the two sides have to reveal what they've done. So, the Chinese, they draw aside the curtain. Everyone is amazed by what they see. The most beautiful painting with really vivid colors and very strong imagery and beautiful 
you know, depiction of what they wanted to portray there. Then they asked the Byzantines to now draw their curtain aside and they want to see, okay, who's the winner? They draw the curtain aside and everyone is amazed as well what they see. It is also a beautiful image on, on their side of the, of the palace wall. Now, what happened here when they look very carefully is that actually the Byzantines painting is a beautiful reflection of the Chinese painting. Mm. What happened was, as the Chinese group had taken all that time and effort to actually paint a brand new painting, the Byzantines, they knew that they would never be able to beat the Chinese at their own game. So, but they were very intelligent. What they did was, they spent all their time polishing their, their side of the marble wall. That's all they did. They polished it to such a high level that it became like a mirror. And therefore, when the, when the Chinese revealed their side of the painting, it was reflected onto their side. And so, what is Jalaluddin Rumi trying to tell us here? What is the moral of this story and how does it relate to the story of Nabi Adam and what we discussed earlier? Well, this is what we mean when we say that a person must try and manifest the attributes of Allah in his character. The marble wall is really depicting the soul of a human being. And the painting on the Chinese side, they are the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their ultimate glory. But the marble wall, the soul of a human being must be polished. It must be purified. It must be cleansed to such an extent that it is able to reflect the beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the moral of the story. This is what we mean. And this is what the traditions mean when they say تَخَلَّقُوا بِأَخْلَاقِ اللَّهِ Manifest, embody the attributes of Allah in your character. You reflect them, you embody them, you manifest them. Just like the Ahlul Bayt did. And that's why they say Nahnul Asma'ul Husna. Salu ala Muhammad wa Muhammad So now let's take this further and look at how it relates to this whole area of teaching in Islam. We'll come to the link in a few moments time. First of all, like I said, inshallah, this is something for all teachers, but in particular, madrasa teachers. And inshallah, tomorrow we'll look at how it applies to learning in Islam and the role of parents. But let's have a look. Islam, actually, the invitation to Islam began with what? It's the invitation to Islam began with knowledge, with teaching, and with learning. How do we demonstrate that? What were the first verses ever revealed to Rasulul Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? They were the first five verses of Surah Alam. Ikra bismi rabbikal ladhi khalaq. Khalaq al-insana min alaq. Ikra wa rabbukal akram. Alladhi allama bil qalam. Allama al-insana ma lam ya'lam. Now what is this telling us? This is telling us a number of very important things when it comes to teaching. How does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala start these first revelations of the Quran? He starts with knowledge. How does he end? He ends with knowledge. Ikra, read in, your, in the name of your Lord. The very first word that is revealed to the Holy Prophet is read. And the last one, the last few words of these five verses, malam, Ya'lam. He starts with knowledge, he ends with knowledge. The whole five verses are replete with references to learning, teaching, and knowledge. In fact, it is as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is painting the picture of a typical classroom. Wow. What do we have in, this, in these verses? We not only have the command to read, but we also have the learner. Who is being commanded? 
Who is the learner in this classroom depiction? It is none other than the Holy Prophet himself. Then what do we have? We have teaching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allam al insan. He's the one who taught the human being. Then what do we have? We have the depiction of a pen, bil qalam. Also, the book. What is the greatest? What is the greatest miracle? The final miracle. It is not like what we were seeing yesterday. The miracles of Nabi Isa, for example. But it is a book. The greatest and the last miracle ends up being something which is a source of knowledge and teaching. Allah Akbar, all of these references to teaching, learning and, and knowledge in these first five verses of the Quran. Now, when we say Allah is the teacher, this is something that really we can all learn from when we are engaging in our teaching. Yeah. Allah is the teacher. Alam al insan, okay? He taught the human being. Now, therefore, when we are talking about teaching in Islam, we have to bear this in mind. It is actually a godly role that a teacher is performing. Just like Allah is the ultimate teacher with a capital U and a capital T, and He is the first teacher with a capital F and a capital T, we are also, therefore, manifesting this attribute of Al-Mu'allim when we are teaching. This is where the link comes in between the story of Nabi Adam and teaching. Nabi Adam is also then told to teach the angels, Allahu Akbar. Nabi Adam is taught, as we saw, he's taught the names so that he manifests them in his character. But then, Qala Ya Adamu an bi'asma'ihim. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in verse number 33? O Adam, inform them of their names. Now a human being is not only taught, no. Now a human being not only teaches, no. Now a human being gets to such a level of perfection, he becomes insan al kamil and now he becomes the teacher of angels. This is the level that a teacher can get to. A human being can rise to such a level that he becomes the teacher of angels. Allah instructs him to now teach the names to the angels. So my brothers and sisters, when we teach in the madrasa, when we teach others, we share others. Okay, our role is not of a teacher officially, but we are helping people. We are teaching them some good, and I'll come to some traditions about that. Then we should realize we are performing the role in our own limited, in our own flawed way, in our own very limited and defective way, the role of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the role of His greatest representatives. This is no you know, lowly thing at all. It is a divine role that we are playing. So now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elsewhere in the Quran, He also talks about His role as being the teacher. What about Surah Rahman? How does the Surah Rahman start? Ar Rahman Allah al Quran. Allah is the all compassionate, then He taught the Quran. So when we are teaching the Quran, when we are teaching others as well in other topics, we should bear this in mind. In fact, there's a very important point here as well. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just before he says he taught the Quran, he points to his great sifa and attribute of Ar-Rahman. Ar-Rahman, the all-compassionate, he taught the Quran. Hmm. This is a lesson for us all, that when we teach, just like Allah precedes his teaching with compassion with mercy we must also be merciful when we teach sometimes we overdo it with our students and sometimes we do not display this right level of mercy and compassion if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
talks about him being a Rahman before he talks about being a teacher of the Quran, we must also bear that in mind and be merciful and compassionate to our students. So, Allah, Muhammad. Oh. Allah. Elsewhere, we are told that actually there's a link between taqwa and teaching. And inshallah, tomorrow I'll talk more about the role of parents and learning. But we are told in Surah Baqarah, what the Qullah. Have taqwa and Allah will teach you. Allahu Akbar. There's a great link here. You see, there's always a link in Islam between knowledge and spirituality. Knowledge and rising towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Gaining of taqwa. Embodying the asma'ullah in our character. These are not detached concepts at all from the Islamic perspective. And therefore we see, my brothers and sisters, this is truly an inspirational role, a role that we should all be trying to take up at whatever level. Nobody can say they have zero knowledge. As I mentioned yesterday, yes, everyone is at different levels. The higher the level of knowledge you have, the more responsibility you have mm. to share it. In fact, we are told in a tradition that everything has a tax. And the tax of knowledge is to share it with others and to act upon it. So everyone has this duty and inshallah, the madrasa needs more people to not only teach, but also to help out in other aspects, in other areas. Sometimes it's not always being there at the forefront in front of the class and teaching. Sometimes it's just as important, if not more important, to be doing things in the background. We can all help out in our madrasas and with our children and even, like I was mentioning yesterday, with people outside of our school of thought, other Muslims and even non-Muslims, sharing knowledge at whatever level we can with others. Muhammad wa In fact, all of this that we do, when we share and teach others, it will only come back to us. And it will come back to us in an even greater way. Let me just mention a few things about this. So we are told Nabi Adam now becomes the teacher of angels. And if we are going to follow in the footsteps of the great leaders of Islam, the prophets and the A'imma we should also try and reach that station or as much as we possibly can. We can never be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course. We can never even reach near His level. But in our own limited ways, we can manifest those attributes. So, some traditions about teaching and how it comes back to us. Well, we are told from Imam Jafar al-Sadiq that in fact, this is the same one I mentioned in one of the earlier lectures, in this series of lectures, where he says that Mu'allimul Khair, a teacher of good, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is quite amazing, the rewards he has for teachers of good. And remember I explained, it, is all, it says of good in a very general sense. So whatever good you teach anyone else, this applies to you. Mu'allimul Khair, whenever he teaches something good, all the creatures on the earth, not just all the creatures on the earth, no. Even the fish in the sea, not only that. Mm. But all creatures, big and small, in the heavens and the earth, they seek forgiveness for him. For someone who teaches good, everything that exists on the heavens, on the earth, on the land, in the sea, everything seeks forgiveness for him. Another tradition from Rasul al-Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A very famous one that you all know of. When a person dies, he is separated, he is detached from all his deeds, apart from three things. Mm. Three things continue to benefit us when we pass away. Mm. And look at this. First one, a righteous child that prays for him. Second one, 
Someone who shares knowledge. He has given knowledge to others. And that knowledge is benefiting them. Allahu Akbar. Look at this. Knowledge that benefits others. That is going to help us in the Akhirah. And of course the third one, Sadaqa Jariyah. Charity that has this ongoing effect. Wow. Now, this is what the station of teachers is in the Islamic perspective. What else do we have from Imam Jafar al-Sadiq again? Salawatu Allah wa salam alayhi. He reports that the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says about Nabi Isa ala nabiyyina wa alihi wa alayhi salam the following that once Nabi Isa was passing through a graveyard when he was passing through this graveyard through his ilmul ghaib he realized that the inhabitant of a particular grave was being punished now it so happened that the following year he passed by the same grave when he passed by that grave he realizes that now that person is not being punished anymore. And so he asks Allah about this, that last year there was this inhabitant of this grave being punished. Now he's not being punished. Why is this the case? You know what Allah SWT tells him? He says, this is because that person, he was a father, he had a child, and his son did two things. Because of these two things, I stopped his punishment. Firstly, he repaired a road. He repaired a road. Mm -hmm. Meaning he provided a service for his fellow human beings. And secondly, he says, he looked after uh, an orphan. Allahu Akbar. You see, my brothers and sisters, whatever we do for our children, whether it's our own children or the children of our community, mm -hmm. when we teach them in madrasa, when we help others in other ways, we share things with them, share goodness with them, whether it's knowledge or some service that helps them, it will only come back to us in an even greater sense. This is the benefit of doing this type of service to the community. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. In fact, we are told that the rewards are so great we should not be taking this lightly at all. These are very important matters for us to bear in mind when we want to serve the madrasa and serve the community. Now, I'd like to gradually bring this to a close and inshallah, I will look at some things that we should be doing when we are teaching the uh, others. And in fact, there's a wonderful book that I would like to recommend. <laughs> It's been published just a couple of years ago. It's known as Desire of the Aspirant. It's published by ICAS Press. This is something I would recommend to all teachers and, and students as well. In fact, it's all about the etiquettes of teaching, learning, and knowledge in Islam. It's wonderful. It's so, like I said, it's called Desire of the Aspirant is actually the translation of this classical text, Munyatul Murid. And Maulana will know about it. It is a book that it is studied in the early days of the Hausa curriculum. So whenever anyone enters the Hausa, they normally study this book in full or in part. Munyatul Murid is by this great author known as a Shaheed al Thani, the, sh the second Shaheed a 16th century prominent scholar of Islam. In fact, he has over 70 works attributed to him. Over 70 works. And it is reported that he traveled very, very widely in order to gain knowledge. So inshallah, these are some of the things that we can definitely look at and it will really help us in our teaching. Salu ala Muhammad wa ala so now I will leave you with this final story and it really tells us about what we should be doing with our children and tomorrow like I said I will build on the whole role of parents when it comes to the 
learning of our children. But this is somehow, if you like, a bridge towards tomorrow's discussion. It concerns none other than Imam Ali ibn Mutaridha sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, when he was in Khurasan, he never failed to, to stop communicating with his son, Imam Jawad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Oh, Allah, so we have in our traditions that he writes him this letter. And in this letter, the Imam says to him that, O oh, son of mine, it has been brought to my attention that the servants of your household, they are always telling you that whenever you leave your house to use the back door and not to use the front door. Okay? And he says that, but this is because of their stinginess. They think that whenever you leave through the front door, you will end up giving lots and lots of charity to all the people who are waiting there for you. So they are, they are advising you to leave your house through the back door. But now look at the advice the eighth Imam gives to the ninth holy Imam. He says to him that by the right that I have over you, I want you to always leave through the front door, the main door. Now, we'll come to the lessons that we can gain from this in a moment. Always leave through the front door. Not only that, but make sure you have with you some gold and silver coins. Then, if one of your uncles asks you for some money, then give him this minimum amount. And if you want, give him more than that. And if one of your aunties asks you for some charity, give her this minimum amount. And if you want, give her more than that. That's up to you. And then he says that do not fear poverty for Allah will not make you poor. So now this is the advice the Imam is giving to another Imam. What can we learn from this? In particular with regards to this whole concept of training our children and enabling them to rise. Well, the Imam says to him, by Allah, I want to raise you. Now, look at this. First of all, communication. Yeah. The Imam was where? He was in Khorasan. Where was his son? In Medina. Look at that distance between Khorasan in present day Iran, near the area of Mashhad, and Medina. A huge distance. Look at the means that were available to the Imam for communicating with his son. Compare that to our situation today. Do we have any excuse for not having effective communication with our children? Mm -hmm. We have absolutely no excuse. In this day of rapid technology and communications, email, even video conferencing, telephones, mobile technology, we have absolutely no excuse for not keeping regular and effective communication with our children, wherever they might be. And that doesn't mean, you know, when the child is upstairs and the parents are downstairs, they send them, you know, WhatsApp messages that, you know, dinner is ready. Not that type of communication. Effective uh, communication that will help them in their progression towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's one thing. Secondly, what was the Imam telling his, his son to do? He was telling him to do those things that would help him in his akhirah. It would help the people as well. Look what he was telling him. You know, sometimes we have effective communication, but with our children, we focus on worldly things. Now, nobody's saying they are not important. Their education, their well-being, their finances, their job, all of these things are very, very important and necessary. We have to communicate with them on those things. But look what the Imam was doing. He was actually telling his son to give more money in the way of Allah. Mm. He wasn't focusing on his financial well-being. He was focusing on his spiritual well-being. How often do we discuss spirituality with our children? How often do we focus on those aspects of their development? You know, so he was saying that instead of, you know, trying to get more and more money, he was saying, give it away. Give more in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It will help others, it will help you, 
and it will enable everyone collectively to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the things that we need to really focus on as well. Let's get our priorities right. Let's concentrate on those things that matter the most. Sometimes we are really focused towards other things. Like I said, sports, finances, careers, education, all of these things are very, very important. Nobody's denying that. But let's get our priorities right and focus on the spiritual well-being of the children in our community. Salaam ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So, as a summary, today we looked at another great prophet in the Quran and part of his story. Nabi Adam, we saw how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him his representative on the earth and he taught him the names. We looked at how this relates to the whole concept of teaching in Islam. Teaching of the names is really talking about manifesting Allah's attributes in oneself. That means manifesting, embodying, reflecting those great names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our own limited ways. We can never be anywhere near Allah, but we can look at His divine names and implement them in our character. Just like he is Al-Alim and Al-Hakim and Al-Adil, we can also be Adil at our human level. We can also be knowledgeable at our human level. We can be compassion and wise and so on and so forth. We also looked at what it means when the Ahlul Bayt salam, say Nahnul Asmal Husna because they have done that at the most high level possible for any human being. Then we looked at the whole concept of teaching, studying and learning in Islam by looking at those first five verses revealed at the outset of Islam. Islam began with an invitation to knowledge and teaching and learning. We looked at how Allah is really the Mu'allim of everything and everyone. We are also Mu'allim insha'Allah but at our own, own level. This is where the link comes in between Nabi Adam's story and the whole t uh, area of teaching in Islam. For he was instructed to teach not just human beings but angels. Then we looked at some of the benefits or, and rewards of teaching in Islam, we must really focus on the well-being of our children and really the madrasa is the prime place for us to be able to do this as well as in the home of course, the madrasa always needs teachers. What a fantastic thing to go into at whatever level we can for it is a godly profession it is a godly role that we are we are conducting when we teach others and in this way we are able to raise our community not just the current generation but future generations as well inshallah let's pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us with the tawfiq to follow in the footsteps Ameen. of the great prophets mentioned in his book Ameen. oh allah enable us to be to be worthy teachers of your teachings Ameen. oh allah enable us to emulate the great imams who were the embodiments of your attributes Ameen. oh allah Grant relief to all those who are facing difficulties around the world. O oh Allah, forgive us and our forefathers for our sins. O oh Allah, enable this madrasa, this community, Ameen. this center and all those who frequent it to flourish. Ameen. And O oh Allah, hasten the appearance of the 12th Holy Imam. Ajalallahu ta'ala farajah sharif. Allah.